Cyberbullying, cyber stalking, cyber fraud, cyber scams, cyber hoaxes, and cyber terrorism. All of these are what we call internet related threats. And it's likely that as a user, you will come under attack at some point. The internet is generally an open and anonymous environment, which makes it a paradise for predators, criminals, and dishonest people. There are many ways to take advantage of unsuspecting and gullible users. In this lesson, we're going to look at some of these ways and show you how to avoid getting caught out. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to distinguish between cyber threats like spyware, key loggers, phishing, identity theft, social engineering, hacking, internet related fraud scams, hoaxes, and DOS attacks. Describe the purpose of safeguards like backup, firewalls, passwords, user access rights and privileges, digital signatures, digital certificates, encryption, SSL and public key encryption. So, are you ready to peer into the darker side of information and computer technology? Right, let's have a look at some of the ways that bad guys will try to sneak up on you. A common way that hackers and fraudsters get access to your computer files is by offering you free stuff that seems harmless, but actually is. This is called a Trojan. Although it will seem like you are downloading something you might want, it's actually installing a completely different program onto your computer without your permission. One type of malware that enters as a Trojan is spyware. Spyware records or spies on things like the specifications of your computer or the websites you visit and sends this information back to the spyware creator. Luckily, spyware can usually be detected and removed with anti-spyware software. Keyloggers are a more sophisticated kind of software that record the keys you press on your keyboard or the mouse clicks you make and even may capture screenshots of your computer. You can also get hardware key loggers. These devices work the same way as the software versions, but the person using the device has to have physical access to your computer to plug it in and retrieve information from it. Hardware key loggers are plugged into a USB or keyboard port on your computer, and then the USB or keyboard is plugged into the computer. These devices either store the information they have recorded on a flash disk or use Wi-Fi to connect to the internet and send the information to a specified email address. There are a few easy things you can do to protect yourself from this type of spying. First, you need to make sure that you have an up-to-date antivirus and anti-spyware software installed on your computer. Second, don't allow people you don't trust to use your computer or install software on it. And lastly, don't use public computers for your internet banking or online shopping. You have no way of knowing if key loggers have been installed there. Bandwidth theft and information theft are also fairly easy for those who have the know-how. Bandwidth thieves take advantage of wireless networks without passwords to access the internet and download files. Information thieves who have physical access to your computer can simply download the information they want onto a memory stick an iPod, a flash drive or portable hard disk. Another way of physically gaining access to your computer files is hardware theft. Computers are generally stolen for their resale value, but sometimes people do this to get the information on your hard drive. If information thieves can't get physical access to your computer, they might try hacking into it. Hacking is the process of accessing other computer systems without authorization or to access, steal, or tamper with data and information on systems, or to send out spam. Hackers are usually very hard to trace or catch because they set up a long chain of computers between their own IP address and their target. Some companies, like banks and software companies, employ professional hackers to help improve the security of their own systems. We asked a professional hacker to tell us a bit more about this. Essentially, hacking is a term um, or coined phrase um, that is 
not actually defined as to exactly where it came from, but it has a, a rather nice ring to it because it almost sounds naughty. Now, and having said that, I can tell you that hacking comes from different origins uh, in that it emanated or originated from people who were trying to, believe it or not, sell their software so they would actually hack into systems and then sell the countermeasure. Now, what is a countermeasure? When someone gets into the world of hacking, they try to get into a system or into someone else's space, if you like, and then they take data or information. And it's very clearly different. Data is just numbers or words or information which cannot be translated and used to make a decision, whereas information is actually processed data. And taking advantage of such, they could literally, if you hear about banks or huge corporations, bring them down. Um, the other reason someone would try to hack is just for fun. And generally, one thing to remember about hackers is they're also network specialists in that they will try to get into a system or your system without actually getting permission and from a remote place. So someone could sit in Durban, for example, and, and hack into a system in Johannesburg, and you wouldn't be any the wiser. Um, there is something that the general public or the, the young guns could actually go in and search for after their lesson, and it is something called CEH. It is hosted by um, the EC Council, and CEH is a certified ethical hacker. Yes, it actually exists. You can be certified as an ethical hacker. So you're actually the bad guy or the bad girl, but you're learning how they work so that you can counter it or find a way to neutralize your opponent in this case, because you will find that when banks uh, fall into the trap of getting hacked into, very often they don't have a security team, or what we call a tiger team, which is uh, quite a neat little um, precept, um, of how to get the data back and also block them. Because generally, you get something called a denial of service attack or a DOS. And what happens is your entire system starts to shut down. It's almost like when a person gets sick. They get a viral infection, which is what this is, it's basically a viral attack or a virus, and your entire system starts shutting down because they don't know what's going on, you know, in, in, the, in the general public's case. So, you know, if they go into that, and, or they Google, uh, as we do nowadays, uh, on the internet, uh, CEH, or Certified Ethical Hacker, they would even get a breakdown of what hacking involves, and it is not necessarily security, though it could be network related. But you know what? A hacker can be somebody as simple as who is in your office, who walks to your machine, and when you're not there or you're on a coffee break or you've gone out for lunch, tries to access your data. They don't have to be in another town, another city, another country. They're sitting right there where you were 10 minutes ago, and they're trying to get in. That's a hacker. So. If you're going to do the right thing, the right thing is to have ethics and social responsibility, but know what it is that they're up to. And they're up to no good, in short. Another type of cyber threat is called social engineering. Social engineering is a term used to describe attempts to con people into giving out confidential information. This will compromise the security of data or give access to a network. One example of this is someone posing as a technician pretending to be there to install new software or to fix a problem. Once he has access to your computer, he steals information or installs other programs like key loggers or spyware onto your PC. Sometimes a social engineer will call you pretending to be from the IT department or help desk and ask for your password to test if the system is working. To avoid this type of attack, always ask for identification from technicians you don't know and never give out your passwords. One possible reason for these types of attacks is what is called identity theft. This crime is when someone gets the personal information of another person to assume another person's identity. In this way, the fraudster can gain access to the person's finances or frame a person for a crime.
One way that fraudsters do this is by what is called phishing. Phishing is a form of internet fraud where an email is used to try to get you to click onto a link or a website that looks official, like your bank's website, for instance. But it isn't the real thing. You can usually spot a phishing email by the general greeting and the request to click on a link to a website. If I were to click on this link, it would take me to the fake official website. When on the site, you would have to log in using your username or account number and PIN. Once you've done this, the fraudsters will intercept your details and they will have everything they need to transfer money out of your real bank account. If you receive an email like this, ignore it. No real bank or business would send you an email like this. If you want to go to your internet banking site, always start your web browser and type in the real address. Never use a link to navigate there. Email is also used to trick you in other ways. A hoax is a deliberate attempt to dupe, deceive or trick an audience into believing or accepting that something is real when in fact it is not. Often the sender just wants to get an emotional reaction from you or waste your time for their own amusement. An example of this would be an email message warning recipients about a new and terribly destructive virus that doesn't really exist. Another could be a plea for a sick child saying that if you forward the email, 10 cents will be donated to help save the child. Sometimes, though, you might receive a hoax email which is part of a scam. For instance, this one tells me that I have won the lottery and must forward money to lawyers that will make sure that I get my prize money. If you aren't sure if an email is a hoax or not, type a phrase from the email into a search engine and see what results are returned. Or you could go to a website like this one to check what hoax emails are going around the internet. Here's another type of cyber threat. A denial of service or DOS attack is generally designed to deny access to a specific site or network, either temporarily or permanently. A DOS attack sends real looking but unnecessary messages to a victim's computer. As a result, network bandwidth is wasted. Disk space is filled with unnecessary data or processing power is spent for useless purposes. This prevents the legitimate user from accessing system resources by shutting down or seriously slowing down a service provided by a computer system. So you can see that there are many reasons why you might be the target of a cyber threat and you need to protect yourself. There are several ways that you can do this. One of the best things you can do is to install antivirus software and make sure that it is kept up to date. An antivirus is protective software designed to defend your computer against malicious software. There are many types of antivirus software and in some cases you can get them free off the internet. To be effective, your antivirus software needs to run in the background all the time and because new malware is constantly being developed, it is important to update your antivirus regularly so it recognizes new versions of malicious software. Secondly, back up your computer files regularly. To back up means to copy files to another computer, tape, drive or server for safe storage. It protects you in case your computer is stolen or destroyed or the hard drive crashes. You can schedule backups so that they are made daily. You can also keep copies of your files in cloud servers. Using a firewall is also a good way to protect your computer from threats. A firewall is either hardware or software, sometimes both. It is designed to prevent unauthorized users or software from accessing a network. Each packet sent over the internet contains not only the IP address of the computer it must reach, but a port number to tell the computer which program must handle the packet. Your computer has ports from zero to 65,535. For a simple workstation with no service running, the firewall will block every port against incoming traffic. A firewall also stops a program on the computer from trying to send unauthorized data from that computer. Always use strong passwords because they are harder to crack. A strong password is at least seven characters long. It doesn't contain a complete dictionary word, your username, real name or company name. It should also be very different from passwords you've used in the past and contain characters from uppercase letters, lowercase letters, 
numerals and symbols found on the keyboard. In some cases, you might have to write passwords down. If this is the case, make sure they are kept in a safe place and destroy them when they are no longer needed. Never share passwords with anyone and change passwords immediately if they may have been seen by someone else. Also be careful about where passwords are saved on computers. Some dialog boxes present an option to save or remember a password. Selecting this option is a potential security threat. If you are sending data to someone else, you can protect the integrity of your data by using a digital signature. A digital signature is digital code that can be attached to an electronically transmitted message to uniquely identify the sender and guarantee that the sender is who he or she claims to be. The signature is electronic and cannot be forged. Since part of this algorithm used to form the signature is based on the contents of the data, it can also verify that the data has not been altered in any way since it was signed. You can get a digital signature from a third party like Microsoft. It is easily accessed in Microsoft Office applications. When you are surfing the net, you can check the integrity of the data on a website by looking for a digital certificate. Digital certificates are issued by a trusted third party called a certificate authority. Examples are VeriSign and Thought. The certificate includes the name of the company, a serial number, expiration dates, IP address, a copy of the certificate holder's public key that is used for encrypting messages and digital signatures, and the digital signature of the certificate issuing authority so that a recipient can verify that the certificate is real. If you want to ensure your privacy or protect important data from unauthorized access, you could use data encryption. Encryption is simply a way of scrambling text or data into a new format using a specified set of rules, making it impossible for other people to understand. You probably wouldn't need to encrypt all the data on your computer, but you might want to encrypt your personal notes or diary entries to prevent other people from reading them. A teacher could decide to encrypt all the files in her exams folder so that if a learner gained access to her computer, the files would be useless. If you wanted to send an encrypted message to someone else, you could use public key encryption. An example of this is a secure socket layer, also referred to as SSL. This type of public key is only used when it's really necessary. Because it's processor and bandwidth intensive, most websites, like bank sites for instance, use HTTP rather than SSL for this reason. You can check if a web page is secure by looking for a lock symbol somewhere on the browser and checking if the address starts with HTTPS. With public key encryption, the message has two keys or passwords. One key is used to encrypt the message and another completely different key is used to decrypt it. You can give anyone this public key because all they can use it for is to create an encrypted message. In order to decode the message, they would need the second private key that is matched to it. This way, anyone can send you coded messages with your public key, but only you can decode it because only you have the private key. Administrators of computer networks will create usernames and allow users access rights and privileges in order to protect data on the network from unauthorized access. The network is protected since only users with a user account and password can access it. Each built-in account has a different combination of rights and permissions. The administrator account has the most extensive rights and permissions over the domain, while the guest account has limited rights and permissions. On NTFS volumes, you can set security permissions on files and folders. These permissions grant or deny access to the files and folders. That brings us to the end of this lesson. Here is a task to help cement what you have learned in this lesson. Draw up a table like this and fill in the missing information. For each method of protection, say why we use this method and how we use this method. Okay.